but it's really important. And I would love to see what you just described uh, with the argument of the algorithm and the data analysis of this. Uh, I think that's, uh, again, medicine has been so uh, analog in many years and so subjective. So I think I'm going to see that it's data. Boom, boom. No, actually, we're 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 we're, uh, we're going futuristic here. Futuristic. Yeah, man. This is this is the. Uh... All right. One more minute. See if this is indeed it's still running the old part of the live feed there. Hey, look at that. Cool. Okay, so one little bit is this is live to the internet. Hopefully, if I reload that page, this should be, yay, there we go, cool. And then hopefully people over there can hear me. We'll, we'll find out. I don't really even know, but we're going we're gonna to see how this works. I'm going to crank that for them. Yeah, there we go. There's my volume. There we go. All right, can we do a quick sound check? Can you guys all hear me? Hey, look at that. Sure. Um, so from my Twitter account, which is at Brad3D, you can get the link from there. Uh, that's where I, I posted it because... Hey, look at that. All right. Only if he didn't turn it off. So maybe he turned it off. He did. Hey, is that better? Look at that technology. All right. I think this is all running. Let's double check. Yeah, look at that. Good morning, everybody. Hi, I am Brad Herman. Thank you for joining me here on day three, early in the morning here at SVVR 2016. Um, I'm excited to be here and happy you've decided to join me. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about VR and mixed reality storytelling. We're going to look back at the last year, kind of what we've been up to, as well as looking forward into the future and what we're kind of excited about. So the first question is, well, actually, we'll do a little overview. So who am I? Why are you here listening to me? Um, my perspective on a couple of things, where things are at today, and my feelings on some stuff. Talk about the past, and then we're going to talk a bit about the future. And occasionally, I'll stop for a drink. So my background. 10 years in live action visual effects, working on films like X-Men and Training Day and Transformers and Pirates of the Caribbean, making cool stuff go boom, making pretty pictures. For five years after that, feature animation at DreamWorks Animation, working on films like How to Train Your Dragon, working on uh, Kung Fu Panda 2, really trying to bring AI into the story and filmmaking process on crowd animation. And the last three years focused purely on VR and mixed reality, especially in terms of storytelling. So I created a group at DreamWorks called Dream Lab, which is designed to focus on mixed reality, virtual reality story and telling. However, when we started, we were looking at, well, what are immersive narratives going to be? Where are things going? And luckily for us, right very early on, we were getting started. We talked to USC about, hey, is this VR thing going to come back? They showed us things like FOV to go, which eventually became cardboard. And we saw the mixed reality lab. And they said, oh, by the way, there's going to be this Kickstarter thing. Keep an eye on that. I'm like, OK. Oculus happened, um, and we knew some people early on in there, and we were lucky enough to actually still have some of the 3D printed headsets they brought us in a brown paper bag from Irvine. Um, I went on to uh, be lucky enough to be at working with Oculus to actually judge their million dollar game jam to be one of an amazing panel of judges. I'm a judge for the Proto Awards down in Los Angeles, 
and recently co-founded a VR and mixed reality startup. So about that last point. So the DreamWorks Animation Dream Lab went from 2013 to the end of 2015. You see our team up there on the screen. Um, towards the tail end of 2015, we talked with execu the executive team at DreamWorks really about what we wanted to do next, where we kind of wanted to go. And with the blessing of the studio, we were given permission to leave and start a new company. So we are now an independent startup, we're now Spaces, and we're, we're setting out to make cool things and really beginning chapter two of the stuff we were up to. All right. So I know this is SVVR, I know you guys all know what virtual reality is, but we're gonna go over a couple of terms here and give you my perspective on these things. So virtual reality is a new medium. Sort of. A lot of these terms get overused a lot. I think it's a powerful medium, but I don't think it's an entirely new medium. I think it's really an amalgam of a lot of other pieces of storytelling, of experience, of gaming, of film, of honestly just sitting down with people and having conversations, of experiences you have in your real life. Virtual reality is a way to present experiences, to present things, and it's certainly an amazing art form where you can make things that you never could have experienced normally, but I don't know if it's true to say that it's an entirely new medium because we've always sort of had these things called eyes and been able to experience the world and look around in us. It's just that things that would have been a lot harder to pull off in the past are much easier to do in virtual reality. Virtual reality is about immersive experiences. Well, this is really where I call that dividing line between when do things become a game, when are things a narrative, when are things a 360 video, you know, at what point do you really have immersion? Um, I like this. I, I, the term actually fits pretty well. I'm usually pretty happy about it. But sometimes people run into things, we'll talk a little bit about it later, where what do you do when people refuse to comply? If you're trying to tell an immersive experience, you're trying to tell a narrative, but they refuse to take something and it really blocks your story. How do you deal with things like that? Virtual reality is all about presence. Well, yes, good virtual reality can really be great about presence. It's very hard to have presence in a 360 video. You know, they're almost always what we call ghost stories. You know, you're a passive observer in this. You can look around, but you really fundamentally can't interact in most 360 videos. When you have true six degrees of freedom, walk around presence, when you truly have your hands there, that's when you can really be the most impactful on your users, on your viewers. The trick is, is that when you have that, you also have this fundamental responsibility of being careful about what you do to them. Because when you have true presence, the impact you have on your users is significantly more than when you don't. And if you want to see examples of that, see what happens when people go through the Paranormal Experience Vive uh, game. So, virtual reality is the future of storytelling. Yeah, this one I'm a little more iffy on. So, it's a future of storytelling. You know, we've never been in a better time and place where people have been making better films, better TV content, better media, better plays. Like, there's so much creativity in so many different forms, so much great storytelling out there in so many mediums, great books. I think VR is going to be a new thing along with those. I think it'll be a way in which you consume some of those things. But I don't think the written word is going to go away because of virtual reality. You know, when we talk about the future of, so I've got the big blank there, right? is that virtual reality is the future of blank. And we're starting to hear this everywhere. It's the future of furniture shopping. And actually, it turns out like IKEA released a Vive experience where you can like go shopping for IKEA furniture. And then by popular demand from Steam users, they added the um, restaurant simulation where you can get the IKEA meatballs. You can't actually buy them in the game, but you can play with them. Um, so I think when that comes to the business, it's VR actually is going to have a tremendous impact on a lot of things we didn't necessarily expect, and I love that. The savior of the visual effects industry. Um, actually, yeah, in a lot of ways it kind of is. It's, you know, this is the industry I came from for a long time. It's actually this tremendous, wonderful second vertical of where all of these incredibly creative, talented, and technical people can actually pour their energy. I think it's also the place that we see a lot of amazing talent from the game side really rushing into right now. But most important, beyond anything else, virtual reality is fun. It's the thing that I want to do. When I wake up in the morning, when I go to work, it's the thing that excites me. It's the reason that you know, we, we left the big corporate structure to go and like, be a scrappy startup and try this, is that 
This is fundamentally something that is fun. All right, so we're going to go over real quick what did we do the last year and what did we learn about some of these things. So one of the things we did was we explored narrative monologues. So what that means is, in terms of a form, is that this is characters walking up to you in VR and talking to you. They're telling a story. It's less focused on you trying to pay attention to action that's going on all around. They pay attention to the fact that you are there, some light head tracking to see that, you know, to face you. But it's really about really beautifully crafted animation performances where a character is coming and having a personal moment with you, as if you came up to them at, like, the, the end of a concert or something and you met them backstage. These were incredibly powerful. We actually found that people loved these. That it was a very simple thing. We didn't need a complex environment. We actually just needed a really well-crafted character that had detail that was telling you something compelling and interesting. And sometimes it would be something silly and funny, like talking to you about like them flossing in the morning. Or sometimes it would be you know, big and crazy. But it's a really interesting space that we're really excited to see where it goes. You know, we explored script writing for a narrative in the round. Um, you know, the scene headings, action, and transition blocks of scripts, when you try to do a VR script, they get big. They start being from these usually one and two line descriptions in a regular script to almost a paragraph. Because in a script, you're trying to convey what the heck is going on all around. You know, we really found that the scripts was still tough to convey what the experience was going to be, but moving as quick as possible into previs, into blocking, and into 360 storyboards was key. Um, and story versus self-direction. So you see the cup there. You know, one of the stories we worked on had a very simple scene kind of early on, but it was one of, much like Aperture Robot Repair, where you're expected to, which is a, hopefully most of you have seen that by now. Um, it's a piece where you're just expected to take a cup from another character. So in this case, he's handing her the cup. Now, this is also how we like block previs. So we actually have like the Theta there in front of her on a tripod, and we're actually shooting with the director, and we're actually pulling all this stuff together. And we actually shoot it this way, and it was going to be a full immersive interactive experience when we, you know, to take it to completion. But all the user has to do is take the cup. And then the person has the next line about they do a toast. Well, what do you do if they won't take the cup? You know, like this is an interactive thing, so we actually want there to be that presence, we want them to take it. So we really worked hard and tried a lot of different things, and what we ended up working the best for us was we ended up having a quick exit scene, which is if you refuse to take the cup, he throws the cup away, just throws it in the air away from you, and then just says, eh, we don't need to do a toast anyway. But we had to make scenes and transitions in that animation so that whichever choice the user made, we could continue on. Because we didn't want to be stuck in that part of the narrative for like five minutes because we're expecting people to run through this in a certain amount of time. High quality animation makes a huge difference. It really does. Um, we poured a lot of time and effort into the faces of characters. Um, you can put low res on a lot of stuff in terms of rigging, on the body, on other joints. Hands are important, hands and faces. Like, it's amazing. And it's certainly something that, you know, we see from character rates from every animation studio is the amount of detail and work put into the face is often as much as the entire body of a character. So the same really does hold true in VR and mixed reality as well. So I would say if you're looking at doing storytelling with CG characters, put your poly budget in the face. It's where people are going to look in VR. All right. Um, using virtual reality for mixed reality previs. So whether you want to call it mixed reality or augmented reality, dev hardware is still starting to roll out on some of these platforms. So if you want to experiment now, like we wanted to a year ago, what we did was is we took 3D scans of real environments. We used things like the Matterport camera to actually make a real world, and then we added intentionally CG content to that world and played with user interactions. We faked it. But it's actually incredibly compelling. And it's a really great way to sort of figure out how you're going to make stuff and where to go next with those things. All right. Gaze and narration. So we played, a, and by the way, it's not actually a real product, but it was the thing we were playing with there. Um, you know, we played around a lot with how does narration work? What's the role of a narrator? Where should the positional sound be from the narrator? So if you go with just ambient overall sound, People will actually look around trying to find where that voice comes from. It's not a problem you ever have in a traditional film. It's not really a problem you ever have in a video game. But if somebody's talking to you in VR, they actually, surprisingly, I guess not surprisingly, expect there to be a spot that's coming from. And you can sometimes do things like put a radio or a thing it's coming from, but then that radio becomes a character. You know, we played around with like having a floating 3D head of the narrator there, and, and people would pay attention to that, but 
then you, your goal with narration often isn't for people to look at the narrator, it's to look at the scene and hear it. Um, we haven't solved this one yet. I'm excited for there to be a solution, but it's an interesting problem we came up that we came across that I'm assuming other people have run into too. Um, for gaze and interaction, for attention, you know, a lot of things have been tried, like dimming things and when you look to look at the right spot, trying to draw people's attention with the narration. We tried things like, hey, look over here. If you have an interesting environment in VR, especially early on right now, people are going to constantly look around at stuff. You know, the density per square meter of stuff that you need in VR for a compelling experience is much higher than you would in a normal game, for example. So really what we try to focus on is keep things simple except where you want the attention to be. You know, we worked on tools for production. Um, we built wide film visualization systems. We did painting storyboards in VR. Uh, last year when I was up here, we talked about having, you know, a Cintiq connected to Photoshop and connected to a VR output so you can actually paint the storyboards in 360 and put the Oculus down and see it. Um, this year we took it a step further. We did some stuff in the Vive where you could actually paint in VR. Actually works really well. It's really fun. Um, but I think we're still kind of a long ways away from that being the right way to do things in terms of someone working 8 to 12 hours a day on it. All right. And we're going to skip, since I know I'm running a, a bit long here for the time I've been allotted, so we'll skip through these pretty quick. But going back a year, this is me on stage last year. Um, I was 30 pounds heavier, um, and uh, yeah, room scale VR. So uh, I know you've probably seen those comics of like, oh, the dystopian future of like people all sitting in a couch and like overweight and you know, yeah, that's not how VR actually works. It turns out VR is actually pretty damn active. Um, if you've ever played Hover Junkers, which is a whole lot of fun, you run around duck and you sweat. It's exciting and. I'm actually excited for what this means in terms of VR mixed reality and people getting out there running around and doing fun stuff. Um, I also presented this slide and talked about, hey, things are going to change a lot over you know, the next year. I had to change this slide just before I presented, talking about like the different types of VR. Um, and well, actually I was wrong. I, I expected there to be more changes on this and really the only things that kind of change is if you want to consider the void a new form up there that is you know, arena scale VR. Um, and I left out 360 video, which honestly I probably shouldn't have. I think it's its own separate media type, but it's incredibly compelling media type to be displayed in virtual reality. You know, something I think that we lose perspective on, especially because we're also in this, is actually how much changes in a year. How much actually fundamentally has changed. So I'm going to take you back to SVVR last year, real quick, from 360 video space. Um, no mainstream support for 360 video at all. There were startups that had cool specialty players, but that's what was out there. Um, stitching was a major pain. Live required a lot of ridiculous special hardware to pull off. And content creation was dominated by GoPro rigs. And storytelling mostly came from indies and explorers and innovators who really just were passionate about it. Let's bring you to today. Facebook and YouTube are already serving millions of views a day in 360. So stitching has actually become automatic in the cloud on several leading platforms. Live stitching or live streaming is supported by YouTube and Hug VR as well as others. And actually, this data right here is currently live. So I'm live to people in VR right now in 360. So are you? Um, so like the fact that like I just plugged this in and clicked a button and went live to 360 now on YouTube, that makes me excited. A lot for where this stuff is going. Um, custom GoPro rigs still kind of dominate, but now there's like an official one that GoPro sells, as well as Samsung, Nokia, and Ricoh, and more with really cool systems out there. Um, and we're seeing storytelling from major brands. The New York Times, Discovery Channel, CNN just announced a channel on Gear VR of 360 content, of a continuous flow of 360 content. So as much as I love immersive interactive virtual reality, I'm a huge fan of it. I think 360 is something that we actually have to be a big fan of too if we want this to all succeed and all go forward. So I'm going to put this slide up here so I can probably be wrong for next year. Um, maybe I'll be right. So this is, this is my quick guesses of where we're going to be a year from today here at SVVR 2017. So Snapchat, Instagram, Periscope, everybody's got 360. Um, stereo VR from Facebook outside of just the Gear VR. Um, Stitching just works. 
I think by that point, no matter what rigs you're using, you will upload your footage to the cloud and you'll pay somebody per second per minute and you'll get it back and it's just done. Um, I think we'll be streaming from our cell phones instead. More camera rigs. And my bonus guess here. I think we'll actually see our first Oscar nomination. So, let me be clear. Not our first Oscar category. That's probably not going to happen or if it does, it's going to be a long way off. But I think there's actually the potential of something that was done in 360 or VR in the animated short, especially, or the documentary short category. I think there's incredibly powerful storytelling, incredibly emotional pieces, incredibly great stuff is being made in both of those areas that actually would qualify for the Academy. Now, what 360 things actually work, you know, for me, you know, from any storytelling perspective? Interesting humans. Interesting humans doing interesting things. It's the hardest thing to recreate in interactive VR. It's the easiest thing to point a camera at somebody, production values aside. Interesting places, the real spots that I couldn't necessarily get to. Um, I'm a big fan of like the realities guys and photogrammetry. I'm exciting where that's going to go. Um, however, that's going to take a while to scale. Right now, as 360 cameras are getting out there, people can just go places and hit record. Um, there's uh, an amazing man in Japan named Inoue who actually just goes all over Japan with these crazy 360 rigs he home builds and just films everywhere and just post a tremendous amount of content every day of these places I never would have gone. Um, the whole genre of let's stick a camera on it and see what happens. Um, like the Blue Angels. That was amazing. Um, and my kid's birthday party. And by my kids, I mean your kids. Um, things that are intensely personal. They're not necessarily things that like other people will find interesting, but they're the things that you will personally want to have and find interesting. It's those personal moments and keeping those and being able to look back. Being able to look back at wedding videos and things like that that really, I think, will make a difference. Now, we have to go quick so I know I'm running out here. Um, where were we a year ago on VR? Uh, there were tons of DK2s next door for demoing stuff. The Vive had just been announced. Everyone's using Hydras for hand tracking and really we're making things for other devs. Now, okay, Oculus and Vive are shipping. I haven't got mine yet, but okay. Mine's shipping. I got it in like minute six on my order. Um, Gear VR, so you can go, they came free if you ordered the S7. Like, that's amazing and great. And there are a lot of Gear VRs out there now. And they're in real people's hands. Speaking of hands, hands have now become pretty much heading towards mandatory in VR. And by the way, by next year, I'm thinking if you're not designing with hands as your interaction metaphor in VR, I think you're going to be missing the curve. Okay. But honestly, the thing I'm the most excited about for the future is VR natives. So what are VR and what are mixed reality natives? So today we have what we call mo mobile natives. These are millennials and people younger than them that grew up never having known not having like an iPhone or an iPad. So these are like, you know, these kids just, that's just their natural thing. So who are the VR natives? So that's my daughter, Aaliyah. Um, Aaliyah's five. Aaliyah's been using and seeing VR since she was two since the DK1, um, she's just, she just knows it. It's just common to her. Like, we've always had it around the house. Um, this is Aaliyah and a Vive. Um, and you may ask, what does Aaliyah do in a Vive? Aaliyah tells stories. This is a pink and purple unicorn. That unicorn has a whole backstory, a whole story she explained of the world it came from as she drew it, for me. And just like she, you know, in kindergarten uses crayons, she's using modern VR hardware just because that's normal to her. I love that. I'm excited to see where all of this goes with what that generation is going to do growing up on this stuff. All right. So I talk a little about mixed reality. What's mixed reality storytelling? Mixed reality is stories in your world. The fundamental difference is that VR can take you anywhere. Mixed reality can bring anything to you. Now, what's the difference between augmented reality and mixed reality? Um, some people would say it's a different marketing term. Um, I think the public may have a bad taste in their mouth from the augmented reality term um, over the years of sort of not getting what they expected out of it. So mixed reality is a chance for us to rebrand. But also when you think of augmented reality, some people think of like, oh, there's a text message floating in my space that like I need to go deal with. Mixed reality is really about moving digital content into your world. So, show a little video here. Hopefully, this will play. 
Okay. Hey, there we go. Hopefully, the audio doesn't come through or not. We'll see. Um, so it's Passover, um, and we had the Afi Komen hunt in my house in the Hololens. So we actually hid matzah around the house holographically, and my son ran around the house trying to find the matzah in a Hololens. That's the power of mixed reality, is that it's these things existing. Is that from him, he just runs around and there's this stuff that just now exists in the house. He can decorate the house. He can see these things. And granted, yes, we still have to head, have a headset on. They're going to get smaller over time. But the potential is exciting. You know, in the new company, what we're really doing is having fun and working with really cool brands. You know, working with Big Blue Bubble and My Singing Monsters. Working with Microsoft. And, you know, making fun stuff. So we don't have the audio out from this, but that's okay. I can tell you what I'm saying, which is, hey, I'm here with my singing monsters, and they're in my world. We can tell compelling stories with these. We can output them in a really compelling way. It's something that's fun for people to see. Um, the power of this, the power of where this is going, is what has us really excited to get. All right. I think I may have time for a question or two, or I'm going to look for. I'm going to look to Carl to do that. One. So I, I have one. I have time for one question. Don't ask one question. No? Great. We're done. Oh wait, we got one. Got to yell because I can't know. We the mic. So honestly, the reason I didn't put a slide in for my VR predictions for next year, quite frankly, is I think 360 is a little easier track to project, and. I mean, like the Vive caught us by surprise. There's so many things that are going to catch us by surprise in VR that honestly, it would have just been, my guesses have been ludicrous. I think I'm excited to see where Sony goes, you know, with the PlayStation especially. You know, that's going to be huge. I mean, that's not a surprise to people, right? Um, there's a couple of easy guesses like that. But honestly, it's up to everybody in this room and everybody online and everybody in our industry to surprise the hell out of me with where VR is a year from now. And I can't wait to see it. All right. Thank you guys all very much. <laughs>